Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming today. It's great to see uh, all of you here. Um, so, yeah, obviously today it's my book launch for my first monograph, um, The Coloniality of Humanitarian Intervention. And before I start, I just want to thank uh, my family and my partner, James, for their help with this book. And also Lauren, who's been invaluable in kind of dealing with all the problems that have arisen and the last minute kind of crises, as well as the War Studies comms team uh, and the SSPP EDI Fund for their support of today's event. Um, I'm just going to introduce uh, the other participants today. Um, so first of all, on the left here, we have uh, Dr. Andrew Talatala, who's a lecturer in Middle Eastern Studies in the School of Languages, Cultures and Societies at the University of Leeds. His research interests uh, centre on the intersections of race and sexuality in relation to statehood and state formation. Uh, and he focuses in particular on the international relations and politics of the Middle East and North Africa through an international historical, political, sociological lens. Um, we also have Dr. Jamie J. Hagen, who's a lecturer in international relations at Queen's University Belfast, where she's a founding co-director of the Centre for Gender and Politics. Her work sits at the intersection of gender, security studies and queer theory, and she brings a feminist anti-racist approach to her work, bridging gaps between academic policy and activist spaces. Uh, she's published in journals including International Affairs, Peace Review and Critical, security, uh, Critical Studies on Security. And lastly, we have Professor Vivian Jabri, who's Professor of International Politics in the Department of War Studies at King's College London. Uh, and is principal investigator of the project Mapping Injury, uh, which is a UKRI frontier research grant. Her research focuses on international political theory, uh, critical social and political theory, post-colonialism and feminist perspectives, with a specific interest in conflict, violence and security practices. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Vivian, who's going to say a couple of words just to introduce the book. <clears throat> So hi everyone, it's really lovely to see such a wonderful audience. And hi Patrick, and hi everyone on the panel. This is a really great occasion because it's a subject that's very close to my heart. I've written a great deal on so-called, I would say, humanitarian intervention. Uh, it's a very controversial subject as Patrick will no doubt um, speak about and as will the other speakers as well. So. Um, just to introduce Patrick a little bit, we've only just met this year. He's a new member of SAF in, in the department, and he is a lecturer in gender and war studies. We have a fantastic team on gender and war studies, I have to say, in, in the department. Um, it's a very dynamic team, and it's a subject that's close to not just to my heart, but to my colleagues' hearts as well. Um, and it's a subject that's intellectually very, very exciting, but also challenging both to teach and to research. And this is why this panel is, is here really. Um, and what Patrick does in, in the book, which I really like, is that he associates this notion of the coloniality of humanitarian in intervention. And we'll come back to what that means in a minute. And I mustn't take over <laughs> Patrick, stop me because I have to run. Uh, b before every, everybody else uh, is finished, unfortunately. So this idea of the coloniality of humanitarian in intervention immediately brings, brings to mind the racialized element that goes on in so-called humanitarian intervention. So the populations targeted in uh, operations of rescue as they are put in political discourse um, are subjected to, to bombardment. So they are seen as, if you like, dispensable bodies in the operations that take place. And the discourses that go on around humanitarian intervention are really the ones that Patrick focuses on in, in his book. And there are really some choice quotes. And I encourage people to read the book very closely because those choice quotes remind me of the history of interventionism and the language that has always been used, not just during colonial times, but post-colonially as, as well, in relation to the Middle East and populations in, in the Middle East. And, uh, and I'm sure that, uh, that Andrew will discuss this. Um, and you see this throughout history, this uh, language of, if you like, racialization, demonization, sometimes feminization as, as well, that, that goes on, and I'm sure Jamie will discuss this element of, of the book as well. However, Patrick does 
much more than the above, because a lot of people do talk about the racialization of populations, including myself, um, in, in these so-called humanitarian interventions, which, by the way, are wars. These are wars, and they are often conducted from the air. So they involve aerial bombardment of populations. We are here to rescue you, but we have to kill you first. In other words, just to quote McDillan, um, very old friend and colleague. So, um, so we have this racialization, and we have this uh, gender discourse that goes on, and that, as I say, Patrick has these choice quotes in his book, says in his book as well. But he does something else, which is really new and really original and really, really thought provoking for, for all of us, which is that he brings in queer theory into understanding war and understanding humanitarian intervention. And he illustrates how this goes on, the heteronormativity of these discourses that I'm that I'm talking about. It's it's a very challenging area to discuss. Why is that? Because our discipline, international relations, it's a fantastic <laughs> discipline. Those of you who are in IR will agree with me, I think. It's the best discipline in the social sciences, I think. But then I'm prejudiced on that front. Um, what does what does IR do? Why is it there? Why does, you know, why does the taxpayer pay our salaries to investigate? international politics and the dynamics of international politics. Why is it interesting? It's interesting because it brings in this notion of what political community means and what those limits around this, around political community means, the boundaries around what our understanding even of political community is. And why is IR interesting is that it places under the microscope, especially the critical side, which all of this panel is uh, belongs to, if you like, the critical side of international politics, puts that language and that discourse, that history, that knowledge under the microscope and investigates it thoroughly. Why does it investigate it thoroughly? Because critical theorists are interested in the microcosm of how power operates. And it's this. This is core to the subject matter. It's how power operates. And it just it doesn't just operate at the UN Security Council. It doesn't just operate in um, the interactions between uh, the various uh, states on, on the international stage. It operates in the microcosm of dealings, if you like. It operates in the neighborhoods on the streets and so on. The humanitarian interventions that go on also are not just practices that take place from the air. They permeate the, the very being of those subjects and individuals who are there on the ground, those neighborhoods, those families, those households whose front door is smashed in by the troops that are involved in these so-called interventions. So. There's something queer about all of this, um, but there's something also very challenging for us. How do you capture all of this? And Patrick's first book, right, is doing all of that. And I wish him all the best and this panel as well. So thankfully, I have a few more minutes that I can sit here and listen to everybody else. Thanks so much, Vivian. Um, right. Um, yeah, so before I begin, um, I just want to say that this book does deal with some difficult themes, <clears throat> especially in the context of the ongoing genocide in Gaza. Um, so do feel free to step out outside at any point if you need to, as there is some heavy content. Um, I also really hope that this book contributes towards academic and activist attempts to resist colonial genocides globally. And I stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people and those who are jeopardizing their livelihoods and degrees to protest the and genocide against them and institutional complicity with it. Um, 
So let's see, this works brilliant. Um, so uh, yeah, just a quick roadmap of today's talk. I'm first gonna look at the kind of social and political context within which the book was written uh, and to which it responded. And then gonna look at the kind of theoretical framework. So the queer literature and the decolonial literature, which politicizes our understandings of time. And then gonna look, uh, just briefly outline the methodological approach, not get too heavy there, but we can chat about that after. Um, and then also kind of, uh, look at the themes of analysis that I found in these debates in question, um, and then themes of resistance and the kind of broad worldview that I argue um, these debates speak to and encapsulate, which is what I call the universal path to democracy. There we go, I have to get it at the right angle. Um, <laughs> so when I began writing this book in the autumn of 2020, uh, it was of course an extremely difficult time for us all as we were settling into a new reality characterized by lockdowns and prolonged periods of isolation, if we were able to uh, be lucky enough to work from home. Uh, this period had a profound impact on the character of the book uh, due to two key reasons. Um, the first of which was that it shifted our collective sense of time on its axis. All of a sudden, the competing demands and frantic rushing around associated with neoliberal capitalism, of course, the system within which we all live, uh, was disrupted. And I think most people had a collective realization that time uh, and the way that we normal organ normally organize ourselves in line with dominant understandings of time isn't the only way to do so. Uh, whilst time intensified and was imbued with a sense of increased risk for those in caring and public facing professions, uh, many period people experienced a period of slowing down uh, and experiencing a new temporal rhythm to their lives. Relatedly, the pandemic acutely highlighted the way in which colonial violence continues to operate. During the pandemic, minoritized groups, and in particular racialized people, were impacted most profoundly. Whilst the predominantly white middle classes were able to isolate safely from home, key workers who are more likely to be from minoritized groups had to continue to go to work for a prolonged period without sufficient PPE and vaccines. Whilst for a while there was a clap for the NHS, Little attempt was made to deal with the deep-rooted processes of violence that persistently put key workers at particular risk. The Black, Lives Ma uh, the Black Lives Matter protests in the wake of the killing of George Floyd also drew our collective attention to the incompatibility of the rights-based language used by Western democratic states and the violence that their political systems regularly commit against minoritized groups, both at home and abroad. More historically, liberal discourse has facilitated the rolling out of one of the most violent social, economic and political systems to ever have existed, capitalism. Through the deployment of sexual, gendered and racialized stereotypes, the colonial civilizing mission has erased indigenous communities and ways of being, which often have a much more harmonious relationship with the natural world. This has produced the situation we are in today to provide a massive jump and oversimplification of the topic, uh, in which life on this planet is persistently, uh, seems to be increasingly untenable, with this in part driving the conditions for conflict, mass violence and genocide. So I kind of say this, not to say that this is necessarily forefront in the book's analysis itself, but it's kind of the broader social, historical and political context within which I'm working and kind of which my work hopes to respond to more broadly. Um, so it's in the context of this that I began reflecting on the role that liberal discourse plays in the ongoing existence of the colonial civilizing mission in world politics. Um, so just briefly some definitions before we get going. Um, in order to visibilize the eliminationist logics that endure at the heart of Western modernity, I decided to focus on humanitarian intervention, which thank you Vivian gave a great introduction to, um, but I understand is the use of military force to prevent the future occurrence of atrocity crimes. So this clearly encapsulates liberal norms of violence in that violence is specifically authorized on the basis of protecting the fundamental human rights of a civilian population. I follow in the post-colonial tradition of using the phrase humanitarian intervention as opposed to R2P or the responsibility to protect uh, as it highlights much broader colonial histories of interventionism in the global south. R2P, for those of you who might not be familiar, it's a much more recent uh, UN kind of based atrocity prevention framework with both preventative and responsive pillars, uh, which include the capacity to authorize force uh, through the UN Security Council in response to an atrocity crime. Uh, 
the utility of this forceful pillar, though, has been significantly contested after the perceived failure of Lib uh, military intervention in Libya in 2011. <clears throat> A second definition that I should deal with here is the term queer, which there's endless contestation over, and, and rightly so. Uh, but are used personally to describe a resistance to processes of categorization, focusing on gender, sexuality, and race, drawing in particular on the work of Sedgwick and Anzaldúa. Uh, this goes beyond LGBT rights-based politics, which I see as a particular expression of sexual and gendered identity in Western countries at the beginning, uh, sorry, at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. Queerness, in my understanding, has the broader aim of exploring and contesting dominant understandings of categories, including of normality and perversion across time and space. Uh, finally, I want to outline my understanding of coloniality, which of course is in the title of the book. Um, so this notion of coloniality was first coined by Annabel Cajano to describe the existence of hierarchical racial categories as a defining feature of modernity. In the coloniality of gender, building upon this concept, Maria Lagones rejects Cajano overly Cajano's overly structural understanding. So he understands gender as simply sex-based resource distribution. Uh, and she moved beyond that, highlighting the multiple processes that violently inferiorized colonized women, replacing gender and sexual pluralism in pre-colonial societies with a universalized gender binarism, for example, through the institution of marriage. Building upon Cajano and Lagones' work, I understand race and gender to be ideological systems constructed to facilitate a globalized Eurocentric capitalism. But I also place an additional focus on heteronormativity, so the sense of rightness attached to so uh, heterosexuality, um, as products of this same process, seeing heteronormativity as the shell within which binary understandings of gender and the social constructs that underpin this exist. And it's this understanding of coloniality as simultaneously sexualized, gendered, and racialized that underpins much of my thinking in this monograph. Um, so throughout the book, I think about coloniality in a distinctly temporal manner to understand the dehumanizing logics that facilitate violence against racialized and queer groups. Unlike much of the queer IR scholarship, I don't under restrict this understanding of queer groups to the figure of the homosexual or to LGBTQ plus subjects, Instead, interrogating heteronormativity as a deeply racist episteme that undergirds the foundations of world politics. In particular, I critique the notions of time that frame European culture as the zenith or the peak of human development, and the global south as either lagging behind or undevelopable due to the deployment of racialized, gendered, and sexualized stereotypes. Explaining the links between colonial stereotypes and modern temporality, Depeche Chakrabarti argued that central to the development of modernity and capitalism was the depiction of a developmental gap between Europe and the colonies, legitimizing this very notion of civilization. This gap had real implications for material practices of colonialism, with J.S. Mill legitimizing the denial of self-government to the colonies on the basis that they were not yet ready for self-government. Now, these very same logics continue to underpin development thought today which cynically posits capitalist economies of Europe and North America as the peak of development and frames the expansion of the market as the universal route to economic, political and social progress. This, of course, is something that we all know kind of doesn't ring true, especially in the context of massive kind of global economic inequality, structural adjustment policies enforced by uh, institutions such as the, EU, um, the World Bank uh, and the IMF. And also, as we discuss in this book, processes of violent interventionism in the global South. Uh, also critiquing one modern understandings of time as progress, queer scholars have studied lifestyles that defy the imperatives of heterosexual reproduction and nine to five work, for example. Explaining how time is organized to generate maximum productivity, Elizabeth Freeman argues that individual, individual bodies are manipulated into maximum productivity through a process called chrononormativity. Applied to the entire population, the state and other institutions narrate strategies for living, including marriage, the accumulation of wealth for the future, reproduction and heterosexual reproduction in particular, attached to notions of biology and bloodline, child rearing and death as normal and natural. And also relevant here in the kind of antisocial queer turn are Lee Edelman and Jack Halberstam's work, which is also really brilliant. So in summary then, by critiquing the temporal understandings that underpin modernity, 
It's possible to understand how racialized and queered subjects are constructed as undevelopment and are subsequently rendered the targets of social, political, carceral, and even military intervention. So the methodological framework then, um, just to outline it briefly, it looks at um, House of Commons debates, UK House of Commons debates on humanitarian intervention between 2011 and 2018. In choosing a violent liberal state, uh, the UK was an obvious choice to me because obviously I live here, um, but also because it made a specific choice to invoke this doctrine of humanitarian intervention um, outside of the kind of R2P framework in 2018. So what that decision to use that discourse of humanitarian intervention did was establish an international legal precedent um, as a kind of, yeah, a change in that ability to legitimise the use of force beyond that kind of UN Security Council approval process, which has since become effectively impossible. Included in these debates are instances in which the UK government successfully securitised an atrocity crime and received parliamentary approval for action, but also instances in which the UK government failed to get assent to act, uh, so Syria in 2013, retrospectively securitized mass violence and specifically the use of chemical weapons in 2018, and also where it failed to act and made a decision to actively not securitize an atrocity crime. Um, and I draw upon the absence, um, themes of absence and failure as significant objects of study here, drawing upon queer and feminist uh, theories. Um, so using a queer and decolonial approach to discourse analysis, uh, this was particularly inspired by the work of Roxanne Dotti, Rahul Rao, Cynthia Weber, and Momin Rahman's work. Uh, and using these approaches, my overarching question was, in what ways do House of Commons debates on humanitarian intervention reproduce colonial worldviews? Doing this, I focused on particular representations of time and the subject positions throughout the debates that made this intelligible or understandable. Um, this book builds upon, in particular, and develops Cynthia Weber's seminal Queer International Relations, in particular, and I hope that those of you who are familiar with the book might be able to spot these kind of interventions I make, which are based on that. Um, yeah. Um, so I can go into this kind of methodological framework a bit uh, more in depth and later on in the Q&A if anyone's interested, but I'm conscious it's a bit, uh, it might be quite a generalist audience, so I don't want to bore anyone with the details too much, but I'm happy to discuss it later on. Um, so the analysis doesn't seek to make a specific normative intervention for or against humanitarian intervention. I think that's really important to state. By contrast, it uses the study of humanitarian intervention to refocus our collective understanding on the deep-rooted processes of ongoing material and ideological violence associated with colonialism, which both directly informs the immediate, the kind of original occurrence of atrocity crimes, but also the way in which they're responded to by the international system. Uh, it's my belief that until this legacy is fully unpacked and explored, the idea of effective atrocity prevention and response is a misnomer. And this is kind of a problem that I have with a lot of the existing scholarship. Um, so the first of the key uh, kind of, sorry. Um, the first of the key cultural figures that I explore in the book is that of the brutal dictator, which features a number of sexual and racial tropes and stereotypes of otherness. A key way in which the meanings associated with the brutal dictator were established um, was through graphic descriptions of violence. These descriptions, initially set out by the government and replicated by many MPs, elicit a strong emotional response due to the specific terms such as slaughter and butcher that were used. For example, in setting out why he authorised airstrikes against the Gaddafi regime in 2011, David Cameron stated that civilians were being killed in significant numbers and the exodus from the town had begun. So there was an urgent need to take action to stop the slaughter. In conjunction with using these kind of graphic and emotive terms, the violence was often framed in specifically sexual and heteronormative terms as directly threatening the institution of the traditional nuclear family. For example, in retrospectively justifying her decision to authorize airstrikes in Syria, Theresa May stated, these images uh, of suffering are utterly haunting. Innocent families seeking shelter in underground bunkers found dead with foam in their mouths, burns to their eyes and their bodies surrounded by chlorine-like odor and children gasping for life as chemicals choke their lungs. Of course, I'm not disputing that these events are horrifying and occurred, but I'm highlighting that these descriptions are deeply selective. They've been particularly lacking, for example, in relation to violence against children or families in Gaza, despite the scale of the violence there again highlighting the kind of importance of absent securitizing discourses. 
Now, of course, there's a qualitative difference here. One of these instances featured the use of chemical weapons and the other didn't, which you know is significant, but the absence here of this similar language invoking families and children being at risk is also significant. By framing the UK as a reluctant defender of innocent children, those supporting action attempted to further construct a binary between the brutal dictator and the benevolent democracy, whose ethical campaign for freedom transcends the national territory and extends to children around the world. This position was summarized well by Richard Harrington in the debate, when he stated that he felt it was his moral duty to vote in line with a position that may prevent a ruthless dictator from gassing innocent children. This enables the UK's proposed response to be framed as one in patriarchal terms that ignore a long history of disastrous interventions, including most recently in Iraq, Afghanistan and Libya. It also relates to Lee Edelman's aforementioned notion of reproductive futurism, which is characterised by the political imperative to protect the children of tomorrow, which Edelman argues kind of encapsulates the entire political agenda, the idea that the whole political sphere is kind of organised to generate a better future for the next generation, the next generation. Of course, deeply problematic in the context of climate change, but that's another kind of discussion. And um, so this is really relevant in particular to the 2018 debate when violence against children was repeatedly cited to help the May administration appear legitimate in a context in which she potentially already broken international law by authorizing force without a UN Security Council resolution. Um, oh, sorry, I went too far then. Um, so the second kind of key discourse associated with the subject position uh, was that of kind of notions of pathology and perversion. Those supporting military intervention kind of added further meaning through this, constructing the brutal dictator as a queer and monstrous figure who needs to be dealt with through military intervention. The clearest way in which this case was made was through the attribution of a flawed psyche to Gaddafi and Assad. For example, in making the case for intervention in 2013, Cameron stated, in the end, we cannot know the mind of this brutal dictator. All we can do is make a judgment about whether it is better to act or not to act. Similarly, in discussing Gaddafi, Natasha Engel attributed him with mental health issues, and Barry Gardner said that he had kind of psychopathic wicked wickedness. Um, some of these discourses also took on an explicitly racist tone, um, with Dai Havard stating, Gaddafi is an Arab and an African. He does not think as I think. He will do all sorts of things. We know that, and we need to respond. These discourses are also similar to those historically used in colonial narratives and Western kind of medical, carceral and political narratives. Um, so in, what springs to mind here is like the construction of the homosexual as an object of medical and carceral intervention to draw upon Foucault's work. Um, the construction of violent women as aberrations who de defy feminine instincts to care, to cite uh, Lisa Downing, um, Karen Gentry and Laura Schoberg and also colonised populations who are framed as infantile and incapable of self-governance, um, to cite Mills and LaFrancois, uh, with this kind of, all of these kind of legitimising some sort of violent intervention. The themes of racism and heteronormative uh, kind of perverted development uh, then are really kind of clear, this idea of deviating from this path of expected or normal development. Uh, given this, it becomes clear that the UK's case for violence rested upon a discursive move that simultaneously racialized the brutal dictator as infantile and also as a threat to women and children, authorizing the UK's use of paternalistic violence. In addition, arguments akin to George Bush's acts of, acts of eagle declaration of evil declaration of made, that's a mouthful, um, framing the UK as part of an alliance of democracies who are holding back a tide of nefarious actors, including dictators, terrorists, and freedom haters. Um, the second key cultural figure I identify and discuss in the debates was that of the ISIL terrorist. This figure was framed as uniquely threatening due to the historic positioning of Islam as diametrically opposed to Western identity in colonial discourses and due to the perceived threat posed to Western societies by terrorism in the post 9-11 era. In this context, attacks on civilians by white people are often framed as lone wolf incidents or as a result of aberrational and individual mental illness whilst attacks perpetrated by racialized populations, including Muslims, are invariably framed as terrorist attacks. Uh, this is reflective of a deeply entrenched Islamophobia in the UK, which has intensified in recent years. And it's this narrative that I think has maybe positioned the Islamic terrorist as the key kind of folk devil of recent times, to borrow from Cohen 
and Stuart Hall's lexicon. Reflecting the racist logics of securitization theory that have been crit criticized by Melanie Richter Montpetit and Alison Howell, the securitization of terrorism as a threat in these debates depended on evaluation of British lives as greater than Arab ones. This was particularly clear in the statements of Gerald Howarth, Margot James and Hel Helen Watley, who all appeared to uh, frame the threat to British lives and national security as crucial to the leg legitimization of force with altruism or moral arguments insufficient um, alone. Uh, so there was this need for there to be a national security threat as opposed to this idea of protecting the inherent value of um, Syrian or Iraqi civilians, for example. Alongside the notion of uh, national security, um, as the dominant logic of interventionism, frequent attempts were made to apportion responsibility to Muslims and Arab countries as a whole for dealing with the threat posed by ISIL. These arguments imply that by sharing a similar skin color, religion, or culture with terrorists, there's an automatic responsibility of su for suppressing them through us-them logics. Um, the clearest example of this is where David Cameron apportioned responsibility to Muslims for the existence of ISIL, stating that we need Muslims around, uh, to reclaim their religion from these extremists. That's happening in our country and around the world, before noting that President Obama singled out and praised British Muslims who've done so. Uh, this logic was direct, directly re reproduced later on by Cameron in the 2014 Iraq debate and the 2015 Syria debate, where he framed uh, the UK's contribution to the conflict against ISIL as supporting our Muslim friends as they reclaim their religion. This discourse implies that all Muslims around the world and the religion of Islam itself are implicated by ISIL's acts of violence. Uh, this is a moral standard that's rarely, if ever, applied to white people who are seen to be diverse with their own individual identities and beliefs, in contrast to Muslims who are othered and assumed to be homogenous uh, due to these kind of aforementioned logics. Whilst white people commit, uh, sorry, I'm just repeating that, but what I'm trying to say here is this is kind of speaking to uh, a worldview that is framed as a civilizational class, so kind of clash between um, the West and the rest or the Western racialized populations to borrow from uh, Huntington's much criticized lexicon. Um, another key argument there um, and is this idea of um, there being appeals to saving Iraqi or Syrian women, children, and sometimes men, with this representing an intertextuality with the brutal dictator as using violence against traditional nuclear families. In conjunction with targeting the family, in the 2015 debate on airstrikes against ISIL, the discussion of violence against gay people also occurred, adding an extra impetus to take action. In making the case for the use of military force, David Cameron highlighted the way in which ISIL is throwing gay people off buildings due to their sexuality. You know, this is a discourse we've seen reproduced again in, you know, in recent days. For example, uh, by Piers Morgan, I think, was talking about this, this idea of Hamas throwing gay people off buildings and that kind of being used to understand the ongoing genocide. So this same example was used by a number of MPs supporting the government's position, reflecting homo-nationalist logics, whereby a country's LGBTQ plus rights record is deployed as a barometer to judge their incapacity or capacity for sovereignty. Meanwhile, no efforts are really made by Western actors to improve the lived experiences of LGBTQ plus people on the ground, instead just kind of using this to legitimize the suspension of their sovereignty and violent interventionism. In analyzing the figure of the terrorist, Jasbir Puar notes that the existence of the terrorist as a queer, non-national, perversely racialized other has become part of the normative script of the US's war on terror. Uh, she cites in particular homophobic racist images post 9-11, noting, for example, the depiction of o Osama bin Laden as monstrous, for example, through cartoons depicting him being sodomized to death with weapons of mass destruction. As will the br brutal dictator, who is both infantilized and framed as a threat to women and children, the ISIL terrorist is both queered as perverse and framed as a threat to gay subjects, again speaking to those kind of contradictions that are, that are central to colonial epistemologies. Again, we can reflect here on an intertextuality with both the homo-nationalist logics and the counter-terrorism discourse that's imbricated with both Israeli justifications for actions in Gaza and the UK's relative inaction in response. Um, so the final cultural figure I discuss in the book is that of the British self. The first of the kind of key arguments that construct the British self uh, as a masculine subject position from which legislators spoke 
was the deployment of masculinist logics of IR. Now, this has been something that feminist international relations scholars, including Tickner, Hooper, Parpot, and Zalewski in particular, have kind of highlighted, uh, challenging neorealist understandings of the international as reproducing conditions for conflict, kind of painting it as an anarchic self-help kind of situation. Um, so the most obvious way in which MPs deployed masculine logics was through the use of technical military language, with this particularly prevalent in the 2011 Libya debate, the 2013 Syria debate, and the 2018 Syria debate as well. Reflecting the techno-speak that Carol Cohn identified in her seminal piece, Sex, Death, and the Rational World of Defense Intellectuals, this language constructs its own kind of sexy and exciting reality, divorced from the lived experiences of warfare. In opening the debate on intervention in Libya, David Cameron gave an overview of the action that he sanctioned. Um, he stated, on Saturday, British forces went into action over Libya. The first British cruise missiles were fired from HMS Triumph at 7 p.m. Subsequently, RAF tornadoes were deployed in several missions. I can announce to the House today that coalition forces, sorry, I lost my place, have ne largely neutralized, it all sounds the same, have largely neutralized Libyan air defenses, and that as a result, a no-fly zone has effectively been put in place over Libya. And in the book, I kind of juxtapose this with a really graphic and horrifying description of what that violence looks like on the ground. So this statement uses um, technical language to describe military hardware, using verbs such as fired and neutralized and listed objectives such as suppressing air defenses and putting a no-fly zone in place. And this is testament to one of Cohn's most insightful contributions, which is that discussing weapons is fun. Uh, in discussing war in the depersonalized language that we kind of just saw there, they kind of form this kind of racy, sexy and snappy discourse with Cohn stating this gives you a sense of control that infuses one relation to the material and in, in, in her article of mastering the fear associated with nuclear war. The final and arguably most crucial area in which the UK government and its supporters reproduced neocolonial neo masculine logics was in its strate strategic use of humanitarian and diplomatic aims. After the intervention in Libya was highly criticized for failing to provide post-conflict reconstruction, the airstrikes against ISIL in Iraq and Syria were presented as an act of care through reference to broader humanitarian and diplomatic aims that the UK was pursuing. So in these cases, in that context of there kind of being a failure in Libya and the UK being seen as a bit untrustworthy, its use of force was framed as an act of care, akin to the kind of you know tough love that we might see given to a child or care that's given to mentally unwell people who were sectioned under the Mental Health Act. As a side note here on racialization, it's significant that racialized people are four times more likely to be sectioned under this act in the UK, which again speaks to colonial binaries of white and black, sane and mad and safe and dangerous. These processes of reinstating reasonable behavior through carceral interventions also seem to be at play here in discourses of violent humanitarian intervention, which hinge upon the idea of using a brief for brief use of force to steer that country back onto the right track towards development or being an international good system citizen on the way to the universal path to democracy, as I kind of discussed later. These discourses didn't apply to the 2018 airstrikes on Gaddafi, for example, and that was kind of because Theresa May framed them as limited, technical and minimal. And also the UK is kind of offered a really limited kind of military contribution there in this context of heightened criticism. In the 2018 debate on the Rohingya genocide in Myanmar, however, humanitarian and diplomatic efforts played an even bigger role. And this was because they were used to frame this genocide as a civil conflict in need of a domestic response, uh, shifting the Rohingya genocide into a desecuritized realm of normal politics, which the Burmese government themselves could deal with. This was evidenced by Mark Field, the minister responsible, praising Bangladesh's generosity in accepting Rohingya refugees and providing a shopping list of the UK's aid donations and diplomatic efforts to influence the Burmese government. This and his choice of not to use the term genocide is deeply significant. Unlike mass violence in the Middle East that was securitized through extreme racist, gendered and sexual tropes as previously discussed, the Rohingya genocide was framed as a simple failure of governance that could be resolved through the UK's support of the regime there. This clear attempt to desecuritize the genocide 
indicates that the UK makes decisions on intervention through the deployment of homo economicus logics of cost and benefit. So what is the UK's material, material kind of economic, political, military expenses to intervene and what does it gain? And this kind of is enabled actually by a colonial, exclusive and racialized understanding of citizenship. The exclusive view of human subjectivity as belonging to white European man that stemmed from the Enlightenment enables this application of cost and benefit anal analysis uh, to be applied to racialized populations in the global south um, with their kind of lives understood again as inferior to British ones uh, and the region's location, GDP, natural resources, alliance and kind of uh, benefits it can provide the UK being more important than the forms of mass violence occurring there. And again, we can draw kind of parallels with the current political moment in world politics. In describing neo-colonial masculinity, Bilgic, Bilgic, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce her name, uh, describes it as characterized by an ambivalence that includes both saving and killing racialized populations. And she does this focusing on the case of migrant uh, crossings in the Mediterranean. This same lens can be applied to the UK's actions in response to the Rohingya genocide, which used that language of assistance, care, humanitarianism to support military inaction. Again, these logics are relevant in the ongoing genocide in Gaza, which has been much more lethal than the Rohingya genocide. Uh, Israel is, of course, long established as a Western-aligned stronghold in the region and has extensive relations with the UK, US and EU, notably in the sale of arms that are currently being used to kill civilians. This application of cost and benefit analysis then helps us to understand why the UK and the US might pay lip service to the notion of a humanitarian pause might continue to drop aid whilst also continuing to fail to sanction the Israeli government, pause arms sales, or take the unthinkable step of responding to these atrocities with force. So moving on to the theme of resistance then, um, I don't wanna go into this in too much depth here just due to reasons of time, um, but I just wanna mention that this kind of fits into the book as a kind of increasing closing down of the options available to the UK government in making these securitizing moves as the debates go on. And this is due to the arguments deployed by MPs uh, as times progressed. I also want to say that initially in con conceiving of the project, I really wanted to look at kind of artwork produced by civilians in the kind of zones of intervention, but kind of due to the parameters of the PhD that wasn't possible and just due to the sheer amount of data. But this is something that I want to do in the future, looking at the impact of the colonial civilizing mission on trans and migrant communities, uh, in particular in Canada, India, and the UK. So it's something that I'm bearing in mind and really want to incorporate in future research. So resisting the construction of the brutal dictator, MPs opposing intervention called uh, attention to the UK's failures and dishonesty in Iraq, also highlighting British arms sales to the Saudi Arabia in the Libya debate. Furthermore, in the Syria debate, MPs opposing intervention highlighted that the UK had overstepped its mandate in Libya meaning the government couldn't be trusted, with this contributing towards Parliament blocking military action. Resisting the construction of the ISIL terrorist, in the 2014 and 15 debates on intervention against ISIL, MPs highlighted the complicity of using force with improving conditions on the ground. They also highlighted the subjective and politically motivated character of the label terrorist, and do it, they did this by asking David Cameron repeatedly to apologize for his unsubstantiated remark that anti-intervention MPs are a bunch of terrorist sympathizers. So what that did was kind of expose the politically character, uh, motivated character of that label and the fact it's actually not an objective designation of a group, but also is one that's kind of used to mobilize support for intervention or violence against a group. Finally, MPs challenge representations of the UK as a benevolent patriarch throughout the debates by highlighting inconsistency in its approaches to interventionism in different regions, as well as its repeated enthusiasm for ill thought out interventions with massive kind of damaging consequences for the regions and countries involved. By highlighting these kind of inconsistencies, MPs closed down that kind of ability for the UK government to make the case for interventionism, especially in the context of its failure in Libya, which I previously mentioned, 
And also the deadlock that there currently is in the UN Security Council due to the permanent members disagreeing fundamentally on issues, notably including interventionism. Where it does act without parliamentary approval, this seems to be kind of, yet, yeah, as I mentioned, a minimal contribution as occurred in 2018. So the kind of broad worldview then that this uh, book speaks to um, is that of the universal path to democracy. Recognising that the tropes, subject positions and meanings discussed within these debates reflect a broader worldview, the final chapter situates these subject positions within a broad temporal framework that I term the universal path to democracy. Uh, within this, Britain and the global Northwest are understood as the telos of civilization, whilst the global South lags behind, or in some instances is understood as undevelopable. In this case, uh, in this instance, the ISIL terrorists, the brutal, brutal dictator, and the British self are personified representations of a British worldview defined by racial hierarchies, hetero and homonormativity, and also the concurrent operation of colonialism and neoliberal governance. Almost making a direct reference to the mindset that I've termed as the path to democracy, Jack Straw compared the struggle for democracy in the Middle East to the collapse uh, of the Berlin Wall, arguing that it would be more difficult for two key reasons. These, he argued, are the existence of autocrats such as Gaddafi and Hussein, and those who seek to use Islam to establish backward-looking autocracies. In this sense, the struggle for democracy was flamed in explicitly temporal terms, um, with dictators and extremists framed as the primitive degenerates that uh, democracy-loving citizens and the UK are battling against. This temporal perspective was frequently reproduced by MPs who did not support intervention, um, indicating the ubiquity of this mindset. This is made further intelligible through discussions of there being a right and a wrong side of history, in spatial depictions of the Arab street versus the British street, and in depictions of the Middle East as being akin to a pre-civilizational state of nature. And it's through these tropes that the attempted at securitization of atrocity crimes in the Middle East took place, and the absence of these tropes in relation to the Rohingya genocide which highlights the violence also associated with not acting. As I've illustrated, Britain being viewed as the telos of civilization is completely incoherent given historic and ongoing acts of colonial violence. This point is, being, uh, is made particularly well by McCurt, Turner and Wolfe, who highlight the existence of liberal democracy as being Sorry, would you, excuse me, I'm really sorry, I'm getting a, bit, a little bit distracted. Would you mind just waiting for two seconds and then, yeah, is that okay? Thank you, sorry to be a pain. Um, so this point is made particularly well by McCurt, Turner and Wolfe, who highlight the existence of liberal democracy as being dependent on the cumulative death of hundreds of millions of human beings through the initial colonization uh, process of colonization, the establishment of empires of trade, settler colonialism, and today's politics of regime change. These conditions expose the ideological concepts associated with democratic governance to be a mirage, with liberalism just as violent as the forms of government that preceded it. In conclusion, then, the colonial civilizing mission is both is sexual, gendered and racialized. And actually, the former two dimensions of this are often really underappreciated. And that's the kind of contribution I really want to highlight as both historical and ongoing. And I know Andrew in particular has done lots of great work in this area as well, which I'm sure he'll speak to. Um, I also want to kind of develop queer IR scholarship, moving beyond Weber's understanding of IR as being structured by figurations of the homosexual to broader notions of normality and or perversion. I also want to make a specific contribution to the R2P and humanitarian intervention literature with a queer approach that foregrounds an understanding of coloniality and moves beyond the LGBTQ plus framework as a sole object of study. I also want to make an intervention into the British politics scholarship, which generally remains exclusive of queer, feminist and decolonial approaches. I also hope that this analysis is transferable uh, to other acts of colonial violence, including anti-trans, anti-migrant, anti-indigenous, 
populations and also the violence associated with inaction and conscious inaction, you know, a conscious decision, for example, not to take any diplomatic measures in response to a genocide. The forms of this colonial violence might change over time, but the colonial stereotypes and archetypes often remain the same or at least similar enough for those of us to kind of be able to map and challenge them. These are also transferable to, um, oh no, sorry. Um, and I also build upon the work of Gaminda Bambra in challenging the Orientalist gaze of academia by centering Europe in decolonial analysis, this idea of kind of fronting, inverting those global north-south north -south dynamics and problematizing the UK uh, through a decolonial approach. And I hope this project's done this. Lastly, as a kind of broader point, I think that, you know, liberalism is currently at a point of inflection. The kind of horrifying acts of colonial violence that we're persistently seeing on our TV screens, committed both at home and abroad, are clearly incompatible with the liberal discourses and democratic language that is often wheeled out persistently in the context or in relation to these um, acts of violence. There's a frequent kind of belief if we look back at the history of colonialism, that colonialism is over and it's been progressively replaced by this kind of liberal rights-based framework from the enlightenment and beyond. And we're gonna to continue to kind of work towards progress uh, and move away from those kind of dark ages of colonialism. Uh, but in actuality, they've always been really deeply intertwined projects. And it's only through liberal discourse of rights-based frameworks that colonial violence um, is able to continue to operate. Uh, and that's kind of something I want to highlight as well. Um, so yeah, that's all. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, oh, brilliant. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Um, so I think the plan now is for um, Lauren, uh, for Jamie and Andrew to give a couple of reflections and then maybe open up to Q&A. So yeah. thanks so much. All right. <laughs> Um, so, mic's on. Um, so actually, this is the third time I've read this book. <laughs> um, I read it twice when I was reviewing it before publication. Um, and now I've had the pleasure to read it for a third time for this panel. Um, and I have to say that each time I've read it, I've gotten something new from it. Um, and it's truly a pleasure to read. So congrats to you. It's a very difficult thing to, um, write a book that covers so much and um, does so much and do it well. Um, the book really does a truly wonderful job highlighting the racism and heteronormativity um, and how they work together to dehumanize certain populations in world politics. Um, and it peeks into all these different little corners and lifts many of the lids. And it does this by taking charge at the concept and policy of humanitarian intervention as uh, Patrick was just talking about. Um, now, while there are many critiques of humanitarian intervention in relation to racism, and who is seen as deserving of humanitarianism, and who is seen as human enough, um, and who is not, um, your book actually digs quite deeply and looks at the foundational logics, especially how those logics are constructed through not just racism, but also through sexuality. Um, and I think it does an excellent job in this. Um, you've really put in the work to build on existing queer work and honor that work, um, which is not always easy to do. Um, quite of it can be, quite a lot of it can be quite dense. And you've really taken that work, you've explained it, um, you've been very, um, you've been very forthright with it, and you've pushed these queer theoretical propositions into new spaces that is really an opportunity for you and also for others uh, to build on. So congrats. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed particularly um, the discussion on important ethical issues. Um, thankfully, you did not talk about those here. <laughs> um, but what struck me and what I kind of keep taking away from this is not, I mean, is how you've uh, put together this discussion on ethical issues that um, come up in your research, as well as in the right in the process of writing and how these ethical issues are dealt with in conversation with colleagues and friends. 
Um, but particularly what interested me was this conversation on centering queer subjects. Mm. Um, now, this really got me thinking about what studies that do center queer subjects actually do um, and how they do it. But for your book, you argue for queer epistemy. So how queer people see the world, how they are required to move around the world. And that really ex highlights the queer experience of life, um, which, like a racialized experience, um, can, but not always, impact how we see, how we move through, um, how we make sense of the world itself. And while you don't center queer subjects particularly, you do later talk about queer subjects um, and those queer subjects in Syria. Um, now, the entire book speaks to a queer subjectivity, mm -hmm. which I think centers queer subjects in a way that specifically, potentially talking about kind of LGBTQ individuals um, may not actually get to. I mean, I've, I've, I'm sure we've all read quite a few horrendous studies that mm. <laughs> um, put LGBTQ people on a graph and try to measure, <laughs> try to measure them. Um, and what your book really does is it speaks to um, a different way of seeing the world, a different way of doing research that honors those individuals that you do speak about in your book. Um, and that's not something that's easy to do. Now, when you do discuss queer subjects in Syria, you make it clear how queer acceptance within a homonationalist and homonormative framework is used to measure and benchmark the civilizational attainment of a society. Now, because of their non-acceptance, by, for example, Daesh, the UK emphasized that humanitarian intervention was necessary. Now, in this way, queer people of color become instrumentalized within policy decisions that seek to pursue violence, and that violence is enacted itself on queer bodies. So at the end of the day, the question becomes, what's the difference between being thrown off a building versus being blown to pieces by a bomb? Mm -hmm. Um, and this in itself, I think, creates new conditions that inevitably place them in more danger in that not only are they in physical danger of both being thrown off a building or placed under a bomb, but the use of their lives in, in these political discourses ends up putting a target on them. Mm -hmm in so many ways. Now, this is a general theme that runs through your book, that trigger-happy policy relies on humanitarianism without the concern for the violence that these policies enact on humans. But what I think is particularly interesting here is how the use of queer safety has become an instrument in justifying humanitarian intervention um, in a way that is so often historically reserved for the heterosexual family unit. And on that, um, I will kind of push you if you have read, I don't know if you have, um, Cynthia, uh, um, not Cynthia, Patricia Owen's uh, work on counterinsurgency and counterinsurgency as social work, right? And how counterinsurgency tries to not just protect the family unit, but also to build the family unit as units that can be counted by um, by uh, neo-colonial states mm -hmm. or imperial states. Um, now, um, what is also interesting, I think, is that in looking at the heterosexual and the family unit, both of which are constructed in opposition to the brutal dictator, um, really made me think of how the U.S. and Britain constructed Saddam Hussein in the run-up to the 2003 war, um, who, as he was once captured, was stripped of all of his power, and the images of him in detention reflected that. He was stripped to his underwear, quite literally, unshaven and old, and it was purposeful that these images were released in the way that they were released to show... Um, American power or Western power um, and effectively kind of a Western masculinity 
as being civilized and good and forever powerful, whereas Saddam Hussein was effectively cosplaying. Mm -hmm. The final kind of element that I want to push you on uh, before I release to Jamie, <laughs> sorry, Jamie, um, is the book and your talk here makes very strong arguments around um, economics and capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, but the book itself doesn't necessarily dig into those areas. Mm -hmm. So the book makes a very strong argument about how the Brit British political class framed um, the non-intervention as a problem, saying that by not intervening in Syria, um, it would produce the conditions that make Assad and Daesh stronger. They also, it also makes an art, the book also makes an argument about intervention being a product of colonial logics, logics, especially concerning racism and se sexuality as conditions of civilization mm -hmm. and the need to intervene in order to civilize and save societies, mm -hmm. but little on the material benefits um, that are, or material benefits or resources that are reserved as kind of post-intervention plunder. Um, and you expose also how Britain positions itself in relation to a construction of civilization occupying a paternalistic policy or policy of civilized engagement um, requiring, as Jim Shannon stated, and I'm quoting from your book here, um, to put Daesh out of business. Mm. Um, now, holding all these aspects together and what you've talked about in your talk as well, what strikes me is the dynamics of arms sales and capital flows. And while you do discuss arms sales to certain regimes, as you, as you mentioned, um, and engage uh, rightfully so in critique of that, I wonder if leaving uh, a more in-depth discussion on these topics was leaving a more in-depth discussion on these topics out of the book was intentional. Um, and if it came up in your research, particularly in those um, Hansard um, uh, materials that you rely on, or if you are planning on doing something on this in the future, mm -hmm. particularly on kind of racial capitalism mm -hmm. and humanitarian mm -hmm. intervention. I'll hold that thought. <laughs> um, Just a few light talking points. <laughs> um, so thank you for, um, yes, this contribution to the scholarship as um, I did want to take a moment to, I think, um, especially as someone who is in what I hope are the final stages of <laughs> making my dissertation into a book, I like to hold the space to honor the work that goes into publishing a book like this, which please pick up and see is over there on the table. <laughs> um, but um, I do want to point to a couple of the chapters that also I anticipate there are people who are in the audience that may want to teach with this, uh, with your book. And there, I would say chapter two and chapter four are, um, will be really helpful for teaching. So I, I teach um, conflict intervention and um, uh, students learn very quickly that I'm teaching decolonizing peace building when I teach conflict intervention. But um, your, your chapter on, um, and also the concrete examples that you use by, it, it's very helpful to have the quotes from the House of Commons. It's very helpful to have what this pink washing looks like in practice, I think, uh, as, as an instructor, but also for students, because sometimes this, um, the discussions about colonialism and racism and the way that um, populations are racialized through these humanitarian intervention um, initiatives are, um, or invasion, mm -hmm. <laughs> as you also note, is another way of acknowledging what is happening, can feel very um, theoretical. And so um, in that sense, I think it's interesting that so much of the efforts to focus on LGBTQ lives are about making it concrete and the lived experiences, but the lived experiences <laughs> and the concrete examples that you provide in discuss discussing um, humanitarian intervention really help us see how this violence is happening. And also um, your um, look at interventions that don't happen, and um, specifically the discussion of the Rohingya genocide and the decision, uh, you know, and this arguing for not intervening and, and 
response to the genocide. So I think uh, as feminists so often argue, it's very important to see what doesn't happen and to see the discussions about why not to act. And you highlight that very well. Um, and also show a methodology of how to look at that, which is really, really useful. And um, I definitely encourage uh, folks to look at that. Um, and I also want to take, so I, as you mentioned, some of the, you know, you, you, I think, generously in your introduction say like here's some of the critiques I've received I'm going to tell you what I'm taking on and what I'm not um and about like why am I talking about humanitarian intervention at a time where maybe this is like especially arguably R2P is kind of like this feels like a dated concept that we kind of mm -hmm. agree is not useful mm -hmm. um but uh, you show, I think, how it is, how it's very much alive, and how, on the one hand, we might be arguing critically why it's not, why it's problematic, and and you know the state shouldn't be racist and intervene, and yet it is, and here it is, and and so um, I think that your book uh, looks at this window of 2011 to 2018 and shows, like, here's what, here's how uh, humanitarian intervention is is alive, and. Um, you know, liberal norms of violence, which I think is, um, again, it's it's something that, you know, I imagine you know, critically critical security studies and critical reflections on, on IR are um, very much challenging the history of intervention and what we're, and, and when states should intervene or not. But your book um, shows the hypocrisy of, of the UK in terms of um, tracing this uh, colonial logic in um, a really, really helpful way. I did want to speak briefly about how I'm thinking about this and how it's useful um, through the lens of women, peace, and security as um, an architecture where similarly I'll be answering the question, why are you looking at women, peace, and security when we have, you know, almost 25 years of uh, how do you implement WPS? Mm -hmm. And it's because there's continual funding. This is the language people are using, and this is yeah. the frame that's active in our political yeah. state, right? Um, but I was curious to hear, so with Tony Hastrup and I, we're thinking about the, the need to domesticate and using the argumentation around what does it mean to look at domestic implementation of women, peace, and security in the UK um, as a way to, um, in some ways, I think, sort of short, short circuit this violence, mm. or at least challenge it. So it made me wonder um, about intervention in that sense. And, and um particularly the, i was i was curious to hear you reflect a little bit about um intervening or not in the case of queer and trans healthcare that's just something that uh, we could maybe um i would just i just think yeah. especially since the so you know the independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity came to the uk released a report and said yeah. there's incredible violence in in the uk because of the lack of mm -hmm. access um, to public or to healthcare for queer and trans folks. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, is an interesting and useful example of the international um, kind of turning the idea of like what sort of intervention might look like domestically for violence that is very well documented. Um, and then let's see if there's anything else I wanted to. Um, and yeah, you talk about the need to, um, the way that, um, Queers might argue that actually, this this intervention to protect the gays is is actually a form of it's an invasion, which was the mention of like having your your door knocked down or um, bombs dropping in your community to protect you, right? Um, let's see if there's anything else that because we've already thrown I think like four questions. <laughs> um, I think maybe I'll, uh, well, it would be helpful, I think, and I imagine we might get at least one question from the audience about this. If you could speak to the um, policy work on querying atrocity prevention and how you see your work speaking to that or um, potential, um, yeah, ways forward in terms of, of course, I'm gonna ask like, what does your work mean for? <laughs> um r2 po r2p policy in in the uk context if if that's something you reflected on so i'll leave it at that great thank you thanks so much really um generous engagement with the book which i really appreciate um sorry i've completely forgot no let me go back to my notes I've, we were saying earlier i've got a brain like a sieve so yeah. oh is it can you hear me yeah all right brilliant i don't know if it keeps like slipping down anyway um so 
yeah, I really this idea of kind of intervention as constructing a society in which yeah, like families are kind of like countable units in which how that kind of facilitates neo-colonial governance. I think it's so I often think of this in like Foucauldian terms, in terms of kind of disciplinary power and biopower and kind of sovereign power. And often they're framed as kind of like sovereign power is kind of state violence, which progresses to disciplinary power, which kind of facilitates capitalism and biopower, which is now what we've got in liberal countries where like power is to maximize life itself. But I think all of these things happen overlapping and at the same time. And I think that, yeah, I just find that like a really useful framework to think through in terms of that. I, that sorry, that's a bit of a vague answer. Is that OK? <laughs> sorry but anyway it makes me think of Foucault and disciplinary power and biopower and how all these things are kind of interconnected through colonial violence great um right so um yeah I thought that this idea of yeah the construction of Saddam Hussein and I think that again this yeah I th it really reminds me of uh Melanie Richter Montpetit's work on Abu Ghraib and this kind of idea of like the construction of the U.S. as a anti-black or a white nation and the role that kind of like sexual violence and in particular the humiliation and the racialized sexualized humiliation of prisoners in Abu Ghraib as kind of a performance which produces U.S. national identity and I think that again it's these same kind of things of kind of like uh yeah the orientalization of racialized men and the feminization of them through these public acts of sexual degradation or violence or whatever kind of that form of humiliation is often in this yeah very public manner i think is one of these performances that reproduces the western nation state as the zenith of civilization and these other ones as kind of being lower down on that kind of step-by-step -step, uh, route to the path to democracy and this idea which is yeah so it's something that I tried to get a bit better at, I think, if I'm going to be completely honest about the integration of capitalism within my work, because I'm definitely more comfortable with the kind of security discourse. But in these debates, I would say, what I because I was looking at the debates themselves as a block, I would say that what came through more strongly in the text was this idea of like exclusive understandings of the human. And I think to an extent that like, so in particular, um, those arguments for non-intervention, it's like whose lives are mattered, uh, don't matter um but i think i kind of restricted it in that just because there was so much in those debates um but absolutely it's something that i definitely want to look at and especially i'm kind of thinking of a paper on post-humanitarian intervention and the non-human and i think that like an emphasis on kind of uh, monetary flows along with kind of all these kind of like maybe in, in indigenous interventions and crip scholarship i think would work really well to kind of look at the non-human dimensions of interventionism which i think that this would fit into better but also more broadly i am working i'm working in particular with on an article with nicholas smith in which we kind of bring both a queer and a, a political economy and security studies lens to right-wing populism in the uk and i think that's kind of how i'm envisaging integrating a bit more political economy into my work because it doesn't always naturally come to my me and my writing style but it's definitely when someone says it i'm like of course, I should have written about the capital flows that that facilitated, but, you know, it doesn't always happen. <laughs> um, and, yeah, the idea of pot diet out of business, that would have been a good good one to pick, pick up on, wouldn't it? But anyway, there you go. <laughs> um, so, yeah, in terms of the domestication of WPS uh, in the UK and how we can kind of reflect on this. So I, the way that I kind of understand my research is kind of studying one kind of coloniality and the sexual gender and racialized dimensions of it and two, political violence, specifically from like the micro and everyday level to the macro level. Um, so, you know, right the way down from kind of microaggressions in the street to humanitarian intervention or genocide. And what's striking in, in, the, in uh, the kind of research that I'm currently doing on um, the media depictions, in, in particular in the Times and the Daily Mail, of migrant and um, trans communities is actually the, the, the colonial script used is, is not identical, but it's not a million miles away from this exact same script. Like there's accusations of kind of, yeah, like sexual violence, um, you know, paedophilia, like madness, um, kind of, especially with migrants that could be terrorists. And these things all, of course, there's an intertextuality between them in the context of like the war on terror and the like, kind of increasing dehumanization of trans populations. 
Um, and then also the kind of historic construction of the homosexual as an object of intervention and the contemporary construction of the trans person. I also think as well, yeah, um, it is ultimately something that I think we can think through the lens of mass violence because, yeah, the conditions, trans people and migrants, are being erased. It's not necessarily as obvious, but the conditions of trans lives and migrants and their capacity to physically exist in a body in the UK is currently under threat. Like it's it's an impossible kind of existence. And I think that actually, which kind of speaks to the next question, I think that actually by kind of using the language of atrocity prevention and mass violence to kind of highlight that, that actually what we're talking about here isn't two separate things. It's part of the same continuum which can be situated within colonial epistemologies, which have historically and continue to commit violence against minoritized groups. I think by kind of putting them within this kind of framework that we can kind of make a really meaningful intervention. I also think as well that like the can, other kind of queering atrocity prevention work, there's like, they they work together and do different jobs. So like, I think that, I am, so um, Dean Cooper Cunningham and Jess Gifkins have written some brilliant work, which is on queering R2P. And I think that there's a real need for these kind of specific policy recommendations, which are targeted at influencing the UK's um, approach to atrocity prevention and highlighting things at home that need to have specific actions. But also there's this need for this broader historical focus and actually putting both of those approaches into conversation with each other is like a really productive thing, I think, hopefully. So, yeah.